Rose Ramp now for our scripture reading. Um, folks, it is page 272 of the Pew Bibles. If you want to follow along, I would love you to do that uh, as we journey through Jonah together. This morning's lesson is from the book of Jonah, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1, on page 927. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amaziah, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray as we stand. Uh, Lord, uh, we are welcomed uh, with open arms just as we are. Lord, we can turn to you uh, or return to you at any time. And you're there and you redeem us through your Son. Lord, help us today through your Holy Spirit. Just guide our hearts and our minds guard and guide my words as I speak, and uh, may we have words to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> and we, uh, oh, forgot my clicker. Sorry, everyone. It's like the weather, you know, the, the, the Now, when we uh, start to think about uh, Jonah, this wonderful book, uh, as I've mentioned before, we, we all have these images in our head, often from um, Sunday school, of these dramatic stories of Jonah falling into the sea and being swallowed by this great fish. Uh, and we can start to say, when we hear about Jonah, we can squint a wee bit, can't we, as grown-ups? Uh, as adults, and we can we can say, start to say, no, really, three three days in the belly of a big fish. We can squint a bit when we when we hear that, and even Jonah, and we think about the association of all the miracles that are in uh, in, in this book, and and uh, uh, and we can just sort of be a bit hesitant about it as a bit. And many a theologian have tried to tackle that problem. There's plenty of books written about Jonah. Uh, and the plenty of theologians has looked into it, uh, and they tried to present all sorts of options for this book to make it a wee bit more palatable. It's a fable, uh, or this is a work of satire, uh, and the fish just is a representation of something of this or that about God. But if we think about it for a second, it's not long to think that that was a dangerous game uh, to play. The things that we see that are miraculous in the Bible, we read about the miraculous in the Bible, are simply just that. They are miracles. They're not explained by science. They're not explained by our experiences even. In fact, this book, the whole of Christianity, 
the truth about God, what we are to believe as Christian followers, is all supernatural. That's sort of the point. The whole idea is that there's something beyond what we see and what we can work out and what we can learn on earth physically. There's something beyond that, spiritual, supernatural. The miracles performed by Jesus, which are totally dependent upon the Christian faith, uh, or sorry, the Christian faith is totally dependent upon that, uh, they're not natural. That's the definition. They're supernatural. God is divine. He's involved. Jesus himself coming back to life. Lazarus being raised from the dead. That shouldn't happen. That doesn't make sense in what, from what we see in this natural world and science or anything like that. It's a miraculous thing. Jesus is alive today. He lives on from his time on earth. He's not contained by the physical body. His body is eternal and forever. Even that is a supernatural thing. That is fundamental to our faith. And then actually when we think about, and this is where science are going and getting to a place where they're realizing that everything around us now is a miracle in a way. The very fact there is anything around us to look upon and to gaze upon. We can't science and common sense says we can't get something out of nothing. Have you ever heard that concept? And yet we have this universe that we can look at and measure and things like that and realize oh it's expanding bit by bit. Oh it must have come from one single source at one time, one singularity, one point in time. Something did come from nothing. But that's impossible, is it not? Without the supernatural, it is. Without some sort of God beyond time and beyond space. The fact that there is anything around us now, for all that came from nothing, is itself a miraculous thing, a miracle. A giant fish swallowing a man and that man surviving, that has to be miraculous. <coughs> that has to be supernatural. That has to be God involved. If God is our creator and our sustainer of everything that there is around us, and if you're here this morning, you're sort of supposed to believe that already, then the miraculous is no worry to God, obviously. And so the virgin birth is not to be a challenge to us. If God wanted the story of Jonah to be a take place so that we can learn that this, this or that about him and his character or about us. And whatever is miraculous within it is just so. It's just a miraculous thing. Otherwise, we start to pick this book apart and we can find God and his powers and his characters. We, we box it in and we can find it to something that's more palatable to us, to us. We sort of shape God into what we want when it's supposed to be him shaping us to what he wants. The other way around. Anyway, Eve, we're going to come to that point in, in Jonah in the weeks ahead. But even if you do struggle with some of the miraculous that you come across in the Bible uh, in Jonah, there are still some very powerful lessons uh, within this book for us, which we will be exploring in the weeks ahead. I really hope that you, you join along with us and read along uh, with us too. So the first thing we'll do is we will dive into these first opening verses and, um, and even what, what Gillian summarised beautifully for us earlier was that this Jonah, this prophet from God, was someone who ran away from what God asked him to do. There's our will and there's God's will. And we all know as Christians whose will is more important, don't we? Jonah is commanded to do one thing. It's a command, that's God's will, and he does the opposite, and in a cartoon way, he goes to the other end of the world, really. He tries to do that effectively. But we know, when we read that, God's will is what we should be after, and that's what Jonah should have been after. The Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy will be done. It's not our will, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. 
So we all know, at least we all should know, that uh, it is God's will which uh, is what it's all to be about. And yet we, like Jonah, can struggle, do struggle, to submit to God's will in our life. Even when life doesn't go our way, things happen to us that we don't understand, that are painful, and are difficult journeys, we think this shouldn't be happening to me. In those moments, we have to say, right, there's God's will, and there's my will. My will wants us to stop immediately. But yet, we're told, the Christian, to, to trust in God and his will in spite of what we go through. So a good thing to look at for this to begin is that um, <clears throat> it's good to know that the characters and the places that are before us are, are real. They're real in the sense that we've got so many other references to them. Jonah is real. Who is Jonah? He is, was a prophet. He was a prophet during the reign of King Jeroboam II. Uh, king Jeroboam II was a bad king. Uh, and it turns out that Jonah prophesied to him. And he sort of prophesied in favour to King Jeroboam. So Jonah has a history and it's not that good a one. We're a bit suspicious of Jonah as a prophet. Uh, he sort of let that king do what he wanted and didn't challenge it. At the same time, Amos was around. He was a prophet and he sort of prophesied the opposite to Jonah. So we have a cross-reference in the Old Testament to Jonah as a prophet. And it's sort of, as a, we're a bit skeptical of his character as we look to this book. But he is a, was a real person in, the, in, in an Old Testament historic context. And Nineveh as well, this big city that we're, we're thinking about, worried about with all these bad people, that's also a real place. That, whereas Nineveh is in northern uh, Iraq, Nineveh was a real city. If you go to the London Museum, there will be sections dedicated to it. And it will come across, it will be all this <coughs> sort of uh, stuff that's there, that this was a, was a, was a tyrant of a nation. Nineveh was the capital of the Syrian people, uh, and they were, were bad people in terms of how they treated others. But let's just begin with what the Bible says. Verse 2 of this week passage, Jonah gets this command, uh, uh, Arise, go to Nineveh, uh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So, right, we get from this, Nineveh, bad, Jonah, you know, has a job to do. But we have other places in the Bible that very clearly point this out as well about Nineveh. If we look at the book of Nahum, which is just two books after Jonah, if you wanted to flick to it, page 937 around there, we have a whole chronicle, or it's, it's, it's called in the first verse, an oracle concerning Nineveh. And chapter 1 of that talks about the Lord's anger against Nineveh and what it's doing. It, uh, chapter 2 talks about the fall of Nineveh. Chapter 3, woe to Nineveh. And I've just picked out a few verses for us. Chapter 3, woe to the city of blood, <coughs> full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. ESV would say all, that it's all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. And that's P-R-E-Y, prey. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots. So we get... The feeling of this is a nation of an army, a, a sort of military sort of nation that are, that are taking over other, other cities and countries. Charging cavalry, verse 3, flashing swords, glittering spears. And then many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over corpses. So not a pretty picture is painted uh, of, of Nineveh. Nineveh is a rough spot. Let's put it like that. I don't know if when you were younger, uh, your parents warned you not to go to certain places. They'd stay away from there. It's a rough spot. Uh, especially don't go there at night. I'm not naming any, naming any places. But we all have those ideas of places. None of it, without a doubt, was a rough spot. Uh, and in ancient times, the Assyrian Empire was known as one of the most cruel and violent of regimes. Uh, its, its history is, is bloody, really. Uh, they would wipe out other cities burn people alive, decapitate people, torture and kill. They would take over a land and if there was any prisoners that they, or survivors, they would, they would undergo really cruel and violent um, forms of slavery. Yeah. So um, 
This was a really, really dangerously bad nation. And it's documented in history, inside and outside of the Bible, a real place and not a nice place. So when the God, to read the God says about this place, its wickedness has come up before him, and that makes sense. And it makes sense that he wants to go and do something about it. But what he goes to do about it is what uh, uh, riles Jonah here. You want me to go to these people, says Jonah? These people, really, Lord? We can immediately understand his stubbornness or his hesitance. In Nahum chapter 3, the God talks of Nineveh and says, Behold, I am against you, Nineveh, declares the Lord of hosts. You see, Jonah is thinking or saying, Lord, you're against these people. You want to help them or something? And I even say, Lord, no, you're wrong. Jonah maybe wants to say that. Instead, he's someone who's a prophet of God, and in spite of God unveiling his, his true will to him in a direct way, he fights against God's will in favour of his own, and he runs away. As Jillian said, to the far end of the world, basically. He's trying to get to Tarshish, and Tarshish, they expect or suspect, is probably Spain. Uh, and in those days, that was like the furthest away place anybody could imagine. That was like the end of the earth if we were trying to, if we were saying Timbuktu or we would say, uh, you know, Australia, the other side of the world. This was Jonah trying to get as far away as possible from the very idea that of what God is asking him to do. <coughs> now, given these Ninevites were the way they were, and Jonah was thinking, for heaven's sake, why would you want me to do this? Why would you want this prophet? The prophets were supposed to counsel the king of Israel and help the people of Israel and now you're sending me to these Gentiles and the worst of Gentiles. This was a call for a prophet to go and stand and wag his finger at them in the town square. That's like one person before or during the outbreak of World War II being sent across to Berlin to the Gestapo headquarters or whatever and told to stand there and condemn them from the street, that wouldn't go well. And Jonah knew this wouldn't go well, or he suspected it wouldn't go well for him. What a waste of time. What a recipe to get killed, a recipe to get laughed out of town. Jonah must have thought, the worst idea known to man. But the problem was it was God's idea. And he felt he had only one cause our, our, our choice of action that was to run, get as far away from this idea as he could, run in the very opposite direction. No thank you Lord. He goes down to Joppa and he finds a boat and Joppa again a real place and a real harbour port and famous for, uh, for shipping uh, and so he's there and he finds a boat and he's off to Tarshish. Tarshish. We get a feeling he's like, he's, he's sticking his fingers in his ears and he knows he's a prophet from God. This is his job. He's been asked to do this weird, strange thing and he just doesn't want to entertain it. And he's sticking his fingers in his ears and he's running the opposite direction. Verse 3, so he paid the fare and went down into it, into the ship, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. The original Hebrew is away from the face of of the Lord. But the Lord, verse 4, hurled a great wind upon the sea. Now can we go away from the presence of the Lord? Can, can we do that? Jillian gave us a demonstration of it. Psalm 139 says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. We can't get away from God if we would try. Jonah was a prophet. God asked him to do something, a very difficult thing, and his response was to bolt and flee. And at the bottom of all that is that he didn't trust God. He did not trust God with his plan, God's will. I don't trust your will, God. It's 
wrong in a way. Does that sort of thing work? No. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest upon the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. So this mighty storm came. We, knew, we know it's a rough storm because the, 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 the boat's ready to break up. It's creaking. And these mariners, these, these hardened uh, ship fair, or seafarers, uh, they're panicking. They're thinking, this is a rough storm. This is rougher than we've ever experienced. These guys will have experienced storms before, but this was a special storm. You could say a miraculous storm. Storm like nothing they've seen before. Now, when people are in a tough spot, they can become a bit more spiritual. Have you noticed that? I have a friend, old friend, who would say, don't get me wrong, he's not a Christian or a believer, doesn't pray, but he says, don't get me wrong, if, I, if the bottom fell out of my world, I would pray. The rest of my life, no, no, thank you. If the bottom falls out of your world, you're at the most sober in your life, aren't you? Life is the most real. You're at the cold face, that's what they say. If people naturally turn to God, or many people naturally turn to God when they're at their most sober in life, then does that not say something? <clears throat> I mean, that's someone who's like these boat seafarers uh, who has no faith in our God. Some of us who have a faith in our God even might have a spiritual life that ebbs and flows a bit. Some of us might have a spiritual life that, in other words, when things are going smoothly, when the waters of life are smooth, we give little thought to God. We maybe even think the reason things are going well are because of the stuff that we did, <coughs> the things that we put in place, and the attitudes that we have compared to others. And we ignore God. But when a storm comes, we can begin to call on Him. Sometimes that calling is, what are you playing at, God? Which is not the way to go. We've looked at that previously. The calling to God when we get it tough, when we're in storms, is, Lord, help me. These mariners were obviously afraid, so much so that they each cried out to their own God, grasping at straws, any God will do. Uh, whichever, whatever God help us. And then they tracked down this strange person who got on the boat the day before or whatever earlier. Um, maybe he, you know, the mariners, their, their, their spiritualness is probably heightened, their, their superstition is, is heightened at this moment. And they've seen this strange guy get on this boat and they have a storm they've never witnessed before in their life and they're desperate. Like, maybe, it's, 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 maybe it's that weirdo. Who's, who's gone to sleep. Maybe this odd Hebrew guest is bringing this upon us. So they go and they grab Jonah and they, and they wake him. Jonah was in the heart of the ship. Um, it's up for debate. Some people think, oh, he's just a seasick person and he wanted to be, he's not used to boats and he wanted to be in that bit that moved the least. Uh, but I think, like, like Gillian talked about, I think he was really in that process, like a wee and a child, running away from God and almost trying to hide, trying to go down into the boat, as far away, hide away, like we might have done as children in a corner when we knew we did something wrong. How are you sleeping, the captain asks, or how can you sleep? Get up, call your God, maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. These mariners put the two, to, two together. This guy might have done something wrong and obviously this God is, is, is not happy. Now it's commonly accepted that, that in the same way a non-religious person, or I should say a non-Christian person, is, um, might think to pray when they're in a tight spot. It's also commonly <coughs> accepted that, that non-Christians who usually don't want to talk about God with you, um, 
And they're more than happy to accept prayer from you when they're going through the most difficult of times. People don't tend to turn down the offer of prayer, no matter what their faith looks like quite often. When someone is very worried and in a bad way, and if you're alongside them and they know you as someone they trust, who they just know you as a church goer, or you do a weird thing on a Sunday, that can be enough for them to trust you enough to pray for you. And that can be a really powerful way in to folks who would never entertain God. So if you have people in your life who are going through really difficult <coughs> situations, offering to pray for them. You might be frightened that they take it the wrong way, but I'll tell you nine times out of ten, I'll go, thank you, yes please. Really something we should remember in our walk. So Jonah is running away from God, he is hiding from God. These non Christian, non Jewish people, they have no faith. They know enough to know that he, they should be doing something. They should be looking for help somewhere. And they're doing the opposite. They're showing Jonah up in a way. When we run away from God, from his will, in favour of our own will, it's, it's, it's not good for us. It's never good for us. It, it can seem like a, a, a wise thing to do from a worldly point of view. And we might think, oh, oh God is giving Jonah a hard time here. He's given him a rough ride. But what this is really showing us, what this is displaying to us, is God's grace for Jonah. God's saving grace is displayed in this opening chapter. He tracks Jonah down. He doesn't let him go. He could leave him in the ship, allow him to sail on and on and on and on. And on away from God's will. Away from this really important role as a prophet in Israel. To the other end of the earth. And that's not a good place to be obviously. But it is God's grace that he pursues Jonah and persists. He still has a long way to go. You'll find that through these chapters. But that is what is following Jonah. God's loving grace. He pursues and he persists with Jonah. He pursues and he persists with us. No matter how we stray on our journey, no matter how we handle God's calling in our life, whether we're running in another direction, no matter how we handle these storms that keep coming up in our lives, have you noticed? No matter how we handle, God can pursue us and persist with us. When we share communion together, there's a wee post-communion prayer that I say from the front. Remember, Father of all, we give you thanks and we give you praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and you brought us home. You met us in your Son and you brought us home, even though we were far off, rushing towards the other end of the earth. That is God's grace. That is Jesus for the believer. We are far off. We can be far off. Going in the wrong direction. Doing our own thing. Our will, our will, our will. <coughs> yes, I know I should, but this sort of first. Me, us, then maybe. Our will, our will. God meets us, brings us home. And he does that when we look to Jesus. In spite of our stubbornness, in spite of Jonah's stubbornness, when you think about it, Jonah's doing everything physically and impractically possible to get away from God. He, doesn't even, he didn't even stick about for a wee debate about it. Well, God, what about these Ninevites? No, he did everything. In spite of his stubbornness, in spite of our stubbornness, even though we know finitely that something is not God's will. 
he follows. It is a dangerous and harmful thing to do our own will and to ignore God's will in life. And uh, ignoring a word from God or ignoring God's word, uh, what we really know is to be wrong. That is a dangerous thing to do. <coughs> but it is all the more graceful that we have a God that in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of how far we get away, in spite of what mess we get into, in spite of how deep this pit is, he reaches down when we accept his hand and pulls us right up on the solid ground. He pursues us, persists with us. He chases down the one lost sheep, leaving the 99 behind. We don't like preaching that the Holy Spirit has, you know, the, the, the main job of the Holy Spirit is convicting us from our sin. But that is one of the main things that the Holy Spirit is for. He, when we turn to Jesus, when we look to him, we are convicted by the Holy Spirit that we are going in the wrong direction. Or the Holy Spirit realigns us, brings us back uh, as we steer off and do things our own way. Good job that the Holy Spirit does that. To stop us from running in the opposite direction. To stop us from going off path. And if we are close to the scriptures, if we are looking to Jesus, then that's where the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And helps us. Thank you God for your conviction when we stray from you. Give us more than that. Thank you God for your saving grace. In particular, the work of Christ, which saves us from our sins. Amen.